of the interesting thing is everybody here is talking about economics, but who do we have? We have a historian, we have a sociologist, we have a political scientist, and we have one economist. I think that's about the right balance. So I'm going to hand it to a political scientist. Thank you. Um, okay, um, Alan asked us all to talk sort of, uh, well, at least ask me to talk around and tell you a little bit about the book, but also perhaps how uh, uh, it might how it bears on the crisis. So that's what I'm going to try and do in the 15, uh, 10 to 15 minutes that I have. I'll try and be as brief as possible. Um, and I, I'd also like to say something about solutions, obviously not, uh, yeah, at least in general about that. So maybe I should uh, introduce the book by telling you a couple of, uh, well, an anecdote and a, and a, and a quip, really. Um, the anecdote goes something like this. I start, I mean, the book has been a very long time in writing. The book I'm referring to is uh, my book, Geopolitical Economy After US Hegemony, Globalization, and Empire. And I've been sort of making my way to the analysis that, I, you, that you will find in this book, which has just been published for more than a decade, basically since the late 90s, if not slightly earlier, uh, uh, perhaps since I first heard about globalization in the 1990s. But anyway, um, by, by the early 2000s, I'd actually begun to arrive at some very definite parts of my analysis. And in 2004, I was asked to um, asked to be part of a panel on globalization. Some business students had put together a panel at my former university, the University of Victoria, and they asked for four of us, me, me and three colleagues, to, to talk about globalization. And so we accepted, and they suggested, well, why don't you four get together and have a talk about what you're going to say so there's as little overlap as possible and the students have a good experience. So we said, fine, that's a very good idea. So we got together, and one of my colleagues started the meeting by saying, well, I'm going to argue that globalization is fantastic. It's the best it's the thing since sliced bread, lifts all boats, you know, prosperity, free markets, etc., etc." My second colleague said, oh, no, 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 that is just so wrong, I'm going to argue. Globalization is an unmitigated disaster, it has led to economic crisis, reductions in incomes across the world, blah, blah, etc. So my third colleague said, who was actually a colleague of mine in political science, he said, ah, well, you see, I'm going to argue that whether you like it or not, globalization is inevitable and we've just got to deal with it, blah, blah, etc. So I was listening to all this, and I thought, I must say, I, I, I had um, some fun uh, doing this. I said, well, and I'm going to argue that globalization is over. And uh, so this uh, then became the basis upon which, and, and you'll see why I, I said that. But you will see, I mean, in, 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 in so far as my book contains, and it does contain a, a, an account of globalization, I, it is what I call an ironic account of globalization, that is globalization some people pointed out, I think quite effectively, that globalization wasn't what it was all cut up to be, you know, and they presented evidence, and they in fact forced such a retreat on globalization discourse that after they wrote, I'm thinking particularly of Hurst and Thompson, but after they wrote, they forced globalization discourse to be so ambiguous that if you try to bend your mind around it, I mean, you know, they say it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that, I mean, quite frankly, it's, it would drive one batty to try and see some any coherence. But anyway, uh, so my, my point is that my, I asked the next question. I said, well, if globalization isn't what it claims to be, then why is it that we suddenly started talking about globalization in the 1990s? So that's the anecdote. It, my account is an ironic one. But of course, when I started writing the book, it had to become much bigger than that. And it had to include empire as well, the notion of US hegemony, empire, etc. And on that, I guess the best way to understand what I'm doing with the idea of empire is the following. You have heard people say that the United States is hegemonic, imperial, whatever you want to call it. These terms are used interchangeably, and of course, every author has his or her own definition of that. Um, you have, of course, heard other people saying that uh, the United States may have once been hegemonic, but it is no longer so, it's in decline, etc. But I don't think you have, uh, it's very unlikely that you have heard anyone saying that the United States tried very hard to dominate the world economy after the model of the UK's dominance in the 19th century, but failed. The United States was never hegemonic. This is my argument. So that's sort of um, 
the, the, the broad, uh, at least a couple of uh, uh, elements of you know how I came around right, to, 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 to writing this book. Uh, very briefly, the book has three arguments. The first argument is what I call the materiality of nations argument. That is to say that uh, uh, people are very used to the idea that classes are the material products of capitalism. We, however, tend to forget that the create the 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 the, 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 the um, uh, the, 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 the division of the world into discrete nation states is also the material accompaniment of capitalism. And if you at all doubt that classes, classes are, sorry, nations are as material as classes, take a look at the statistics for inequality today in the world. Your level of income, your level of welfare is far better, far more closely correlated with your national belonging than it is to your class belonging. That is to say, inequalities between nations are much greater than inequalities between classes. So that's the materiality. And, and, and I think, of course, there is also another element to the materiality of nations argument. Capitalism is contradictory. Nation states have had to historically act in capitalist economies to deal with those contradictions, both in terms of domestic state interventions and in the context in the broader international sphere um, in a broader logic which the Bolsheviks called uneven and combined development, in which dominant countries seek to preserve existing uneven configurations of capitalist development, and contender nations come up from below to contest these and acquire productive capacity themselves. These nations do not just include the Chinas and the Brazils and the Indias of today, nor just the South Koreas and the Taiwans of yesterday, but also, very importantly, Britain herself in her own time, but also uh, the United States, Germany, Japan, etc. These were all have been contender states in their time, with enormous amounts of state intervention in their development. That's the first argument. My second argument is that given the logic of uneven and combined development in which although there are very powerful nations who have attempted to defend uneven configurations of development that favored them over the long historical run, we have seen uh, repeatedly the triumph of one phase after another of combined development in this process. And this, rather than any even spread of markets or empires or whatever, is what is responsible for the spread of productive capacity around the world. It has not spread widely enough for our taste. I'm sure we are, as socialists would agree that the world is still too unequal, there are still uh, too many nations that are poor, but it is this logic that has expanded a productive capacity around the world, spread it around the world, not markets or something called pure capitalism, which I'll come to in a moment. So the second argument, therefore, is that the domination, uh, uh, the, the, the UK's domination, as the first industrial country in the world, the UK's domination over the world system was inevitable. But it was also unrepeatable. And so although the United States, which had always been expansionary, imperialistic, etc., from its beginnings, although it, um, uh, 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 it wished to, 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 to extend its domination around the world, and it made repeated attempts to do so, it failed. Because the conditions that were necessary for such domination did not exist. There are a variety of them. I, I talk about them in my book, but that's the second argument. The inevitable UK hegemony and the impossible US hegemony. And um, my third argument is that in the process of trying to maintain un uneven configurations of capitalist development over which they dominated or attempted to dominate, both the United States and the UK produced what I call cosmopolitan discourses, discourses in which the world capitalist economy appears to be a seamless whole, single economic <coughs> unit. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, Britain produced free trade, and then of course, belatedly in the UK, US's case, because the US case is much more complex, it was never hegemonic, but belatedly in the 1970s, the discourse of US hegemony comes on, 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 on stream, and the most recent manifestations of these discourses are globalization and empire, which are very interesting uh, uh, from a point of view of their cosmopolitanism. The one says that no nation state matters, they're irrelevant. The second one is interesting cousin of this view. States matter, but only one state. And that's the United States. That, uh, and, and all the others, they may huff and they may puff, but they can never blow, blow US dominance down. But of course, as we shall see, they have. 
Okay, so, um, uh, uh, so th these are the three main arguments. Let me just tell you briefly about some of the elements of, of the book. So uh, one of the things I do is uh, in the book is, uh, and of course the name geopolitical economy, it occurred to me at a very late stage in the book, and of course when it did occur to me, uh, what blew me away was the, was the fact that nobody else had thought about this term before. Uh, I, I think it was begging to be, uh, to be born, and, and well, I was glad to oblige. Um, and, and there are many, uh, and there, there's, a, there's a, a, a lot of, you know, basically the term contests the idea of a, uh, that a capitalism is a purely economic system, that it's always uh, uh, um, states are involved, and the states are involved both domestically and internationally. And when we look at the international sphere, we don't just conceive of either no states mattering, that is, you know, simply cosmopolitan, purely capitalist, uh, uh, purely economic capitalist economy, but we think of contestation as being the central element, because this is what is going on in our time. In fact, one of the points I make about my book is that it tells you uh, a, 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 a new history of modern capitalism, or the history of capitalism, which is modern, which makes the emergence of multipolarity understandable. Because if you are, a, 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 if you believe in globalization or empire or whatever, contemporary multipolarity seems to have come out of nowhere. You know, it doesn't make sense. And I'm telling you a story in which it makes sense, it is the natural and inevitable product of, of that. So um, I, I then also show you, I could reconstruct an intellectual tradition within which, it, you, and this may surprise you, but there are, uh, the, the sort of contrary evidence uh, was always there, but the, but the dominant discourse uh, tended not tended to ignore it, basically, and I trace this intellectual lineage back into classical political economy, uh, up to and including Marx, and then sort of leaping over neoclassical economics, which is no good, you come to the critics of neoclassical economics, such as Keynes, such as Polanyi, etc., all of whom do help us to understand what's going on. Um, uh, I, cr I also have a very, uh, uh, I think many people have told me already now that the book is being read, I'm receiving feedback. The critique of hegemony stability theory uh, is very surprising to many people because most, of, most people have never contemplated the very simple fact that it did not arise until the 1970s. So the so-called period in which the United States was allegedly hegemonic, 50s and 60s, never saw the emergence of such a theory. Because quite frankly, the hegemony was entirely retrospectively constructed in that period itself. If you actually examine the historical record of the period, as I do in the book, you will see that it was terribly contested. Okay, so we can talk about that. Um, uh, of course, I, I give my novel an ironic account of globalization and, and a very different account of empire. And uh, uh, I, I tried very hard also to include a, a military uh, element, and I was told recently in a roundtable on my book that much to my gratification, I must say, because I worked very hard to ensure that I was uh, including, you know, I was essentially making it a complete and, and, and comprehensible uh, picture that the military element of the story really was uh, uh, really very useful for people, so I include that as well. Um, just a couple of points to, to, to round off my uh, the, uh, the things in it. Uh, of course, a key point is that when the United States began nursing the desire to, uh, to emulate UK dominance, uh, by the time it did so in the early 20th century, it could not do, go the whole hog. One thing it could not do was have formal colonies, because basically the world was accounted for. So uh, it basically settled for making the dollar the world's currency, and New York, uh, so the dollar should replace sterling, New York should replace London, very nice, simple, except it forgot one thing. The dominance of sterling and the dominance of New York was based on the uh, uh, possession of colonies. In fact, I was joking the other day to somebody that the gold standard should not be called the gold standard, it had nothing to do with gold. Perhaps it should be called the India standard or the colonial standard, because surpluses from the colonies, uh, India was a very large colony of Britain, were key to the maintenance of the international monetary order of the 19th century up until 1914. So, uh, and I think that the fact that we don't know this also means that uh, too many of our best critical economists have tended to ignore the very, very central role of imperialism. You know, we all love to talk about imperialism, but we do not actually uh, understand the role that imperialism really played 
in the constitution of capitalism as we know it. Um, and of course, uh, so, so then a lot of book becomes a, 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 a narr narrative of how the US repeatedly attempted to provide the dollar with a stable basis, but it was an impossible task because the sine qua non was not there. And everything else it could muster was always temporary. And, and so it fell apart, and then it, it went to something new, and so on. And my point is that today, uh, the, 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 up and, the, the sort of up and down of the dollar today also becomes much more comprehensible in the context of my analysis of the dollar itself. So much of the book is taken up by, uh, uh, I think, a fairly wide, like it's, I, I, I think I talk in fairly uh, um, uh, simple terms, and so most people will be able to understand what the fundamental problem is with the dollar. So then solutions, um, just in, uh, I, I'll just quickly state them and then end there. I think that if states are central to capitalist economies, I also think that there is a sort of false rhetoric of uh, op uh, or oppositions between reforms and re re reforms and revolution, which should not be there. I think that part of the solution should simply be that people should create collective movements and collective mobilizations to demand what they need from their states. I think this is a very simple thing. Whether it is a, a, a environmentally sensible and, and, a, and economically necessary industrial policies that you know do not allow your own domestic economies to go be lay waste to free trade and so on. Whether it is welfare, whether it is spending on cultural activities, all of the things we need, we should simply demand. I think that the fact that capitalism is suffering a crisis with every sort of overcapacity and uh, uh, over. Uh, production will simply mean that if capitalists cannot invest, and it is quite likely that they will not be able to, they will simply become less and less relevant to our life, and it's very possible that the end of capitalism will come with a whimper and not a bang. So uh, I think that this is what is one thing. At the international level, I think progressive movements need to support um, uh, inter forms of international economic governance that are not premised on the dominance of any states, but on the sovereign equality of states. So that each one of them, and here I think Keynes was very important, each state has the capacity to manage its own affairs internally and enter into those economic relations with other states, whether they be for investment or trade, which are mutually beneficial. There is, I'm completely in favor of more trade, more international investment, but not on terms that devastate some economies and enrich others. So, uh, and, and finally, I would say that since I talk about nationalism, um, actually nationalism is typically regarded as, you know, basically the close cousin of fascism. I think true nationalism is compatible with true internationalism. And, uh, and, and that is to say that uh, if you're truly nationalist, you also recognize the other people's rights to order their own societies in the way that they would like, support democratic forces there, etc. But because typically international uh, cosmopolitan discourses today also have tended to uh, uh, support uh, uh, the in imperial interventions of dominant states, and that has to stop. And I think it can stop.